Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you very much, Mike, and uh, thanks so much for reminding everybody that I'm old enough to be a grandfather. <laughs> But uh, anyway, that's, that's a really fun thing, by the way. Uh, it's good to do it when you're young, too. You can uh, appreciate it more. <laughs> and uh, it is wonderful to be here. It's my first time in Yellowknife, and uh, I've really enjoyed myself. And, uh, and I can tell you that I'll be back, OK? Maybe not to give a speech, but to back as a tourist is what I'm hoping. Uh, it's a wonderful part of Canada, and it's, uh, I'm too old to have waited this long to come here. You know, once uh, Shakespeare wrote, neither a borrower nor a lender be. Well, that may have been reasonable advice back in Hamlet's day, but it's hard to imagine a modern economy like ours functioning under that kind of dictum. Now, for most Canadians, debt is a fact of life, at least at some point. Borrowing can help someone get a higher education or buy a new car, purchase a home. Now, simply put, debt is a tool that allows people to smooth out their spending throughout their life. Now, the amount of debt held by Canadian households has been rising steadily for about 30 years, not just in absolute terms, but also relative to the size of the economy. Now, at the end of last year, Canadian households owed just over $2 trillion. Now, mortgages make up almost three quarters of that debt. Now, while debt is indispensable for our modern way of life, it's been a growing preoccupation for the Bank of Canada for several years now. And that's because high debt levels can make us vulnerable to negative events, both as individuals as well as the entire economy. There are two ways to look at this. Traditionally, our focus has been on the vulnerability of Canada's financial system arising from elevated indebtedness. This means analyzing how our banks would manage a serious economic recession with high unemployment and increasing debt defaults. But the bank is also focused on the vulnerability of our economy to rising interest rates given high household debt. There's little doubt that the economy is more sensitive to higher interest rates today than it was in the past and that global and domestic interest rates are on the rise. So today, I want to talk about household debt in Canada, the dynamics that led to its buildup, how big of a problem it is for Canadians now, and how we can manage the risks in the years ahead. Now, $2 trillion of debt, that sounds like a pretty big number. Now, let's try to put some context around it. Now, a common way to measure household debt is to compare it with the amount of disposable income that people have. So in Canada's case, household debt is about 170% of disposable income. In other words, the average Canadian owes about $1.70 for every dollar of income he or she earns per year after taxes. Now that ratio is a Canadian record, and it's up from about 100% 20 years ago. Now this ratio is on the high side, but there are other economies such as Sweden or Norway, Australia, who have even more household debt relative to disposable income. And that international comparison reveals some common factors. Now like Canada, the countries I just mentioned have all seen decades of steadily rising house prices. They all have high rates of home ownership and deep, well-developed mortgage markets. So like Canada, mortgages in Australia are typically amortized over 25 to 30 years. In Norway and Sweden, you can find mortgages where the homeowner is only making interest payments, and the principal is passed on from one generation to the next. Now, aspiring to own a home, that's part of our culture. It's also a way to build wealth for the future, as house prices have tended to rise faster than incomes. So my colleague, Deputy Governor Larry Chambry, took an in-depth look at the drivers of house prices in a speech in 2015. He found that many factors working on both supply and demand were pushing prices up. On the supply side, Canada is a highly urbanized country, and many of our cities have land use constraints that limit supply, such as green belts and other zoning restrictions. <clears throat> 
Geography in the form of mountains and water also helps to limit supply and that supports prices. In terms of demand, well, several factors have reinforced an extended trend toward higher prices. These include demographics and a long period of low long-term interest rates. But the point I want to stress here is that when you combine a strong desire for home ownership with rising house prices, you'll naturally find increasing debt levels. Now, the connection between low interest rates, rising house prices, and increasing debt is worth considering in a bit more detail. Now, the goal of our monetary policy is to deliver low and predictable inflation by keeping supply and demand in the entire economy in balance. Now, if inflation is too low, we can lower our key policy interest rate and expect to stimulate demand for goods and services. When we raise interest rates, we expect to cool demand. Now, you would expect then that relatively low interest rates would lead to strong demand for housing. And looking back, mortgage rates shifted into a lower range around the late 1990s. Now, in part, this reflected a global trend toward lower inflation and interest rates overall. But it also reflected the fact that the Bank of Canada had built some credibility around its inflation targeting policy, which began in 1991. Canadians had come to expect that inflation would remain low, and interest rates moved lower accordingly. And this is when our long-term rise in household debt took root. Now, the situation took another dramatic turn in the wake of the global financial crisis in 2008. Central banks slashed interest rates, in some cases, to zero, and sometimes beyond zero, and kept them at historically low levels for an extended period. Internationally coordinated fiscal and monetary actions from 2008 to 2010 provided stimulus, and these helped the world to avoid a second Great Depression. But our economy has struggled to gain traction in the last 10 years, not least because our recovery was interrupted by the collapse in oil prices in late 2014. But today, inflation is on target, 2%, and the economy is operating very close to its potential. However, given the lingering effects of the shocks that I've mentioned, the economy still requires some stimulus. So let me make a very basic but important point here. Policy stimulus has a cost, whatever form that it takes. Whether delivered by monetary or fiscal policies, stimulus encourages growth by bringing forward household spending and business investment financed with debt. Now, I spoke about these debt dynamics in the Purvis Lecture two years ago. If fiscal policy takes the lead in stimulating the economy, well, this can result in a buildup of government debt. If monetary policy takes the lead, this brings about a buildup in household debt. In both cases, stimulus leads to a buildup of debt over time, whether it's public or it's private. And excessive debt levels create this vulnerability, making the economy less resilient to future shocks. And this is why policymakers need to consider the debt consequences of the mix of fiscal and monetary policy. Well, ultimately, what matters most is the burden of servicing debt relative to income. In other words, the lower the interest rate, well, the more debt a given household can afford to carry. I know the bankers understand perfectly what I'm talking about. So for this analysis, we look at the debt service ratio which is the required payments of interest and principal expressed as a percentage of your income. Now, remarkably, the aggregate debt service ratio on mortgages for Canadian households has been very stable, remaining within a range of 5 to 7 percent since the early 1990s. And what this means is that Canadians have taken advantage of lower interest rates to carry a higher level of debt thereby keeping the debt service ratio more or less constant. Now, you can see how this would arise. Financial institutions are mainly interested in a borrower's ability to service his or her debt out of regular income. So lower interest rates make it possible to purchase a more expensive home. Furthermore, with improved access to credit, in particular the widespread use of home equity lines of credit,
or affectionately called HELOCs, it becomes largely a matter for households themselves to choose their overall level of mortgage debt and to use that debt for a wider range of purposes. Indeed, Canadians, regardless of their age group, are increasingly relying on mortgages. Now, among people under the age of 35, the percentage of homeowners with a mortgage is high. It's edged a little higher from about 85% 85, 85 in 1999 to around 90% in 2016. But for people in the 55 to 64 age bracket, not mentioning names, right? <laughs> the increase was more dramatic from 34% to 46% people holding a mortgage. And this casts a new light on that 170% debt to income ratio that I cited before. <clears throat> Excuse me. Notice that the 170% figure re represents an average across all Canadian households. It includes all those who have little or no debt, which means to make the average level of debt so high, it also must include some very highly indebted Canadians. In fact, about 8% of indebted households owe 350% or more of their gross income representing a bit more than 20% of total household debt in Canada. So 8% are holding 20% of the debt. These are the people who will be most affected by an increase in interest rates. And we're closely watching the vulnerability represented by this group and the debt that they carry and how it poses a risk to both the financial system and the economy as a whole. And it's important for these households to understand how personally vulnerable they may be in this context, recent changes to mortgage regulations are particularly welcome. This includes rules requiring people to show that they can service their debt at higher interest rates. These regulations are helping to reduce the economy's vulnerability because new borrowers will be more resilient than existing borrowers. And there are signs that these and other rules are working. As we've already seen, a significant reduction in the issuance of very high loan-to-income mortgages. But these mortgages regulations apply only to new mortgages. The stock of household debt, including the $1.5 trillion in existing mortgages, will persist. And this debt has increasing implications for monetary policy. And as I said at the beginning, a significant issue for us now is gauging how much more sensitive consumers and therefore the whole economy, have become to changes in interest rates. It's particularly important right now because the economy will require higher interest rates over time for us to meet our inflation goals. Given current levels of household debt, we expect that moves in our policy rate will have a stronger impact in cooling demand than they did in previous years. But this is a significant uncertainty for us. The sensitivity could be larger or smaller than we expect. Now, since last July, the bank has raised interest rates three times, taking the policy rate from 0.5% to 1.25%. It's still too soon to know just how strong an impact these moves will have. Now, there are many reasons why interest rate changes take time, actually up to about two years, to fully work their way through the economy. For example, consider that the majority of mortgages in Canada have a fixed interest rate which is usually adjusted only at the end of the term, and very often every five years. Those fixed rate mortgages that haven't been renewed since last July have yet to be affected by the interest rate increases. Some of the people renewing in the last few months may even have been given a rate similar to one that they received five years ago. Of course, those who've opted for a floating rate mortgage, which actually is about 25% of all mortgages, have already seen their rate resetting higher. That said, we're seeing some other evidence of the impact of higher interest rates. Banks have increased interest rates on new loans, not just on mortgages, but also other forms of consumer and business borrowing. And we've also seen signs that the growth rate of borrowing has begun to moderate. Now, you may be wondering where interest rates are headed. Well, we know there's some level for our policy rate that's considered neutral. That's where the rate will neither stimulate nor cool the economy. 
Now, this neutral rate can't be observed, and we don't control it. And what's more, it can move around over time as the global and domestic economies evolve. But despite this uncertainty, it's a useful reference point for central banks for three reasons. First, the further the policy rate is from the neutral rate, the greater the impact on the economy. Second, because the neutral rate does change, any given policy setting can become less or more stimulative over time, even if the central bank keeps it unchanged. And third, if the neutral rate in an economy falls low enough, it may be difficult for a central bank to provide enough stimulus in the event of a serious downturn. In our monetary policy report last month, we published our latest estimate of Canada's neutral rate of interest, saying that it falls somewhere in a range between 2.5% and 3.5%. And that assumes that all the shocks affecting the economy have dissipated. Now, at 1.25%, our current policy rate is still well below our estimate of the neutral rate. With supply and demand in our economy currently close to being balanced, you might expect our policy rate to be much closer to neutral. But several forces appear to be still acting to restrain the economy. And we talked about these in the NPR. They include the new mortgage rules. They include ongoing uncertainty about U.S. trade policy and the renegotiation of NAFTA. And they include a range of competitiveness challenges affecting Canadian exporters. But these forces won't last forever. As they fade, the need for continued monetary stimulus will also diminish, and interest rates will naturally move higher. Another benchmark for measuring monetary stimulus is the real rate of interest. That's defined as our policy rate minus the rate of inflation. Today, our inflation-adjusted policy rate stands at minus 0.75%. Now, as the economy progresses and the forces acting against it fade, the need for an inflation-adjusted policy rate that's below zero is steadily diminishing. All this to say that we're becoming more confident that the economy will need less monetary stimulus over time. Still. As we approach every interest rate decision, we need to consider all the risks relative to our forecast, including those related to household debt. So if we were to raise interest rates too quickly, we would risk choking off growth and falling short of our inflation target. If we move too slowly, well, we risk a buildup of inflation pressures that would cause an overshoot of our inflation target. At the same time, though, moving too slowly would mean a further accumulation of household debt and rising vulnerabilities. Well, moving too quickly could trigger the sort of financial stability risk that we're trying to avoid. So as you can imagine, getting the path of monetary policy right involves a lot of judgment. Now, bank staff have recently developed an important new way to evaluate these trade-offs and to help inform this judgment. And today, we're publishing a note about this work on our website. Now, briefly, the framework uses our models to calculate the risks to the economy associated with various hypothetical interest rate paths. And by examining many such paths, we're able to sketch the trade-offs involved in choosing any particular path. Intuitively, higher interest rates will mean slower economic growth, but they'll also mean reduced financial vulnerabilities. As a result, the impact on the economy of a major financial stability event would be less. So from this starting point, the framework then allows for the inclusion of macroprudential policies, policies like the new mortgage guidelines. By reducing financial vulnerabilities directly, macroprudential policies improve the trade-off that policymakers face when choosing when to adjust interest rates higher. So put another way, macroprudential policies allow monetary policy to deliver similar results for growth and inflation without exacerbating financial vulnerabilities. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for me to conclude. I know if Shakespeare were writing today, he might say that our financial system 
gives Canadians more choices than ever in deciding whether to be or not to be <laughs> in debt. But today's record level of household borrowing reflects the evolution of our financial system and the comfort level of Canadians in taking on debt. But it also reflects a prolonged period of very low interest rates and rising house prices. Now at the Bank of Canada, we've been watching these debt levels very closely because of the growing risks that they pose to financial stability and the economy. And we know that a portion of Canadian households are carrying large debts, and the concern will become larger for them as interest rates rise. Of course, higher interest rates would likely reflect an economy that's on even more solid ground and less prone to a major economic setback. Furthermore, our financial system is resilient, and the new mortgage rules mean that it's becoming progressively more so. Even so, our economy is at risk should there be an unexpected increase in bond yields or a global slowdown, because both effects would be magnified by their interaction with high household debt. Ultimately, the bank's job is to look at the economy as a whole and judge the outlook for inflation. And today, the view is quite good, even with the shadow cast by household debt. This debt still poses risk to the economy and financial stability, and its sheer size means that its risk will be with us for some time. But there's good reason to think that we can continue to manage these risks successfully. And for the benefit of those watching on the webcast, let me just repeat those key messages in French. En définitive, le mandat de la banque consiste à examiner l'économie dans son ensemble et à porter un jugement sur les perspectives d'inflation. Aujourd'hui, les choses s'annoncent très bien, malgré l'ombre que jette l'endettement des ménages. Celui-ci présente encore des risques pour l'économie et la stabilité financière en raison de la taille même de la dette en cause, ces risques persisteront un certain temps. Il y a cependant tout lieu de croire que nous pouvons continuer à les gérer avec succès. The economic progress that we've seen makes us more confident that higher interest rates will be warranted over time, although some monetary policy accommodation will still be needed. We'll continue to watch how households and the entire economy are reacting to higher interest rates, and we'll be cautious in making future adjustments to monetary policy guided by incoming data. I thank you for your kind attention. And now we'll have a Q&A. Yeah. All right. There was an extra mic here. Yeah, I put it right here. Oh, uh, right there. Okay. And we'll let you use that one. Oh, oh. Or do you, would you rather use the podium? I would use this one. I will use this one for sure. All right. Okay, so now we have some time uh, for some Q&A. We have a mic set up right there. Um, so we get about 15 minutes to do a little bit of Q&A. Yeah. Uh, I ask that you step up to the mic, introduce yourself um, if you'd like, and uh, ask Governor Pulau's a question or two. And don't be shy. Mike guaranteed to pay me a loony for every question that I get today. <laughs> I did. Which is quite something. <laughs> Just a loony, though. That's it. For each question, though. <laughs> <laughs> I have confidence in my room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we, there go. we go. So uh, nowadays, uh, the uh, debt is uh, 1.7 times uh, annual uh, income. Yes. And a number of years ago, it was one. That's correct. Uh, one to one. Uh, but the interest rates have declined uh, considerably since over this 20 years or so, yes. and have you done a, a comparison to see how people can uh, ca carry their debt currently compared to that how it was when it was a one-to-one -one ratio? Thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, in fact, I'm, I'm sure that lower interest rates uh, were an important contributor to that rise in debt. And so in effect, uh, when um, when people are deciding what, what can they afford, the interest rate and the level of debt are both on the table. So uh, you say, well, with that interest rate, I can afford this much debt because my monthly payments will just be this much. And so I can afford that larger house or uh, something with more, more features, whatever, uh, than I could at a higher interest rate. 
So in effect, what people have done, I think, is that they have, they've tried to buy what they can given what interest rates are, and that's you know, led to more housing being bought and more debt to go with it. Um, and so they can, as of the last couple of years, they could manage it just fine because the interest rates are so low. Uh, our concern, of course, is that interest rates are really low. Everybody, no, you know, when I meet, thinks interest rates are normal or anything. They just think they're they're low, and they are low compared to anything we can describe as neutral. So uh, we're suggesting that you know interest rates at some point, you know, they're already begun to rise. Well, through time, as as uh, as these forces acting on the economy dissipate, interest rates will drift higher, and that means that people who have committed to these debts will face higher debt service costs for those debts they've taken on. And that's why the stress tests that the banks are doing now, and not just the banks, but all, all mortgage, most, let's say, all, most mortgage lenders are doing now, um, are so important. They ask you to qualify for the mortgage at an interest rate that's two percentage points higher than the one that you're getting today. And that means you have a buffer in your finances to be able to carry that should interest rates rise before you get renewed. Uh, and I think, Rather than think of it as a rule, I mean, some of these things, you know, rules make a lot of sense sometimes. Like they had to make it a rule that you have to wear a life jacket in a boat too, but it always made an awful lot of sense, right? And so I think here too, an individual um, should be thinking themselves, well, well, how would I cope with a higher interest rate? You know, stress test themselves rather than waiting for the bank to do it for them. So right now things are fine, but the ten the, the the tensions there, the the vulnerability is increasing, and since the economy is close to where it belongs, uh, interest rates are are headed higher. Okay, next question. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Governor. Um, my name's uh, Chief Ernest Bettina of the Yellow State First Nation, and welcome to uh, Chief Dragos Territory. Delighted. Thank you. Um, speaking about mortgages and, 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 and houses. I've got a question for you. Um, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but uh, for mortgages, for Chief Dragos territory that I just mentioned, um, and working with the indigenous government, um, what, what do you see as, as uh, obstacles or, or not obstacles uh, provide mortgages to First Nations uh, peoples in, in, in uh, Chief Dragos territories, for instance. So uh, I don't know if you can answer that. Well, I, I, look, I, that of course is a, a very specific uh, problem, but of how the market performs in a, in a specific area, which I'm not that well equipped to, to answer. But uh, when there are, when there are, if you like, market breakdowns or market barriers, we hope that over time that they will uh, become less. And I think one of the things we've seen is that through the modernization of our financial system, some of those barriers have become less through time. But I, don't, I can't comment specifically on your question, Chief. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. Uh, just a question going back to household debt, a little bit more specific. Uh, looking at student loans, mm -hmm. uh, student loan debt, uh, younger populations, underemployment, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot more around uh, contract type opportunities and prolonging life decisions as it relates to uh, purchases, homes, people are getting married later in life, et cetera, et cetera. Right. When we're looking at that from a national standpoint, you know, what are the risks and, and what do we predict uh, in the future around that? Okay. What's the next question? <laughs> well, that, one, that one's worth like $2? That's a, that's, a, that's a $2 question. You've got that right. All right, so it's a complicated question. So uh, you're right that uh, there are some important demographics at work here, and the labor market has not been very positive since the crisis. So the last 10 years, uh, it's been a, it's been more difficult for young folks uh, to break in uh, to the workforce, and uh, so we have seen some of that, you know, stretching out of things. So uh, that's you're absolutely right about your observations. Um, now, 
one of the, you know, my, our narrative around that is that it is all a product of that crisis and the long, the big recession and the slow return to normal. As we actually in 2013, I thought we were within a year of being back to normal. And then of course we got 2014, we got the drop in oil prices and we had another three year detour. So if we're just finally now to where the economy is operating close to potential. But even so, we, we are convinced that there are remains untapped potential in the economy, and you put your finger on where a good part of it is. So participation in the uh, workforce by youth is still quite a bit lower than it was before all of this happened. And uh, so what we think is happening now is that the labor market is, is heating up. We're seeing some good movements in uh, wages now, now in the last, uh, say, six to eight months. Wages have been picking up speed. Uh, that is drawing more people into the workforce and uh, companies who are in a position to expand, if they're not waiting to hear about NAFTA, you know, companies are expanding. Some companies are waiting or postponing those decisions. So it's not operating exactly according to the models, but, but it is operating. So we are in a stage where we call it the sweet spot, it's kind of our sweet phase, where the economy can grow faster than its potential because it adds to potential as it grows by investing more and employing more people out of that untapped uh, workforce. And so as we've seen this happen in the U.S. over the past two years, as they've been close to potential all that time, and inflation still has not, it's just now reached their target. And so that means that whole two-year period was extra growth that, you know, strictly speaking, you know, is kind of a surprise that it's, it's happened. And it's only happening because it's tapping into untapped potential in the workforce, in their case, uh, mature uh, workers. In our case, it's much more predominant in the younger categories and in the women workforce. So we're hopeful that both of those will increase their participation through this sweet spot phase. And as that happens, you'll see some of those life decisions, I think, becoming more uh, closer to normal. That's, that's my aspiration, though. It's, uh, it's not quite a forecast, but that's the dynamic that we're expecting to observe. Perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Here comes a banker question. Right, <laughs> yeah, just like, who gave those people all that debt? <laughs> just kidding. It uh, sounds like your office has a, a pretty good handle on uh, what's going to happen with interest rates and, uh, <laughs> and inflation. Uh, so I, I guess the question would be, what keeps a Bank of Governor Canada up at night? Uh, and uh, yeah. you know, what uh, risks do you see to the economy over the next little while? So I have a list of things, and so when I, whenever I give a different answer, somebody asks me, why did you change your mind? Because they, they asked me a few months ago what keeps me up at night, and I said something else. But, um, but, I, but to, be, to be honest, I think the, I mean, this, this household, the reason I'm giving a whole speech on this is because that's, it's, it's a legitimate concern. It's not theoretical. It's right there. And, uh, you know, you work right in, the, right in the front of it, so you know exactly uh, what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, in the past when we've had fluctuations in the economy, we've demonstrated a degree of flexibility and financial arrangements. So I'm hopeful that the system will continue to work well that way. And I think, I think that's, that's a resilience feature, let's say. It's not uh, nothing's carved in stone, et cetera. So that's important. And that's one of the ways that people have managed to keep the debt service ratio more or less constant through time. It's not all for the reasons I gave, but in the past it's been you know, because of flexibility. Uh, so that's the positive, and I know our financial system is very resilient. So I, I, it's not that that keeps me awake, but I, I am concerned about the transition and how it goes. If you want to know what really keeps me awake at night, it's a cyber event. That's, that's such a big unknown. I mean, I, you know, at least with household debt, we can analyze it. We can look at all the micro data. We know so much about that. Uh, there are things we don't know, but at least we, 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 uh, we believe we have an understanding. But a cyber event, you know, we, we believe we're well prepared, we believe the system is well prepared, but then you wake up and you read about something has happened, and I know they were prepared. So that's, that, that, that is uh, for us, you know, being sort of the stewards of the financial system, that it, um, it's, it's, it's the thing that gives you a lot of concern, and we're investing a great deal into resilience, redundancy, and preparedness to, for the day after, so that uh, 
Canadians can continue to count on their financial system uh, doing its job. But that's, uh, that's, that's taking a lot of our attention, frankly. Uh, Garth Walbridge, I'm a lawyer and business owner in town. You <clears throat> quite appropriately are concerned, aware, thinking about household debt. Yeah. Um, something I think a fair bit about is government debt uh, and appreciating that you are, you know, the federal government is, I suppose, in some <clears throat> fashion, signs your paycheck. You may not be able to comment too much about that, but, but let's talk, if we might, if I could ask a question about municipal and provincial territorial debt. I get the impression that the people within those kinds of governments are still prepared to borrow money based on taxpayers' ability to repay that debt over time and without perhaps enough appreciation of the aging baby boomers. Do you folks, do you have an, a handle on that? Do you have an idea about that? What, what sort of analysis would you have about government, apparent increasing levels of government debt at a time when I think that the, there's a, a reduced ability to pay coming up over the next decade or two? Right. So, you know, First of all, for starters, all that stuff about the government and what they're spending and so on is just, uh, for us, an ingredient into our models. And you're, you're right, you hinted that it wouldn't, be, uh, it wouldn't be the sort of thing we normally would comment on, the appropriateness or whatever. For, so for us, there are ingredients and then we put them in. And, uh, and I did talk uh, here about how um, if, if you have a recession in the economy, you, do, you kind of have a choice whether you use fiscal policy to stimulate it, to kind of get things back on track, or use monetary policy, or use both. And I wanted to make it clear that you accumulate debt no matter which of the tools you're using. And so the fact that the federal government is in, uh, has a very relatively low uh, indebtedness level, like some around 30% of GDP, much lower than any other of the major economies, uh, that's in part because over the last number of years, it's been primarily low interest rates that have offset the the forces uh, that are acting on the economy. And then, uh, you know, a few years ago, then we they started with a, the child benefit and so on, and there's some di some differences in fiscal action there, the infrastructure program, and that has given us a different mix of policies, so the two debt piles are, are moving differently. If we had no fiscal action, there would be a lot more household debt today, because interest rates would have stayed lower, or maybe gone even lower than they did. That's the point that we're making there. So this is the mix question. Uh, but in terms of the, level, the overall level of indebtedness, uh, there, just as a global proposition, there does seem to be quite an accumulation of debt, both private and public sector. And, uh, and you're right, combining that with the demographics that many of us face, it looks like a potential issue. However, we are living longer, so this is something to be, you know, like uh, quite a bit longer, actually. So we are as uh, you know, the baby boomers, you know, built all this, if you like. The, there's been a huge bulge in, in, uh, in people in the workforce from, from about 1960, let's say. Um, 1960, when we, we were all born sort of in the, uh, in the you know, 40s to 60 period, so that, and then 15 years later, you get this entry to the workforce. And so it's about a 50-year bulge in the workforce, and we all got used to that in that 50 years of pretty steady growth in the economy, but it was being fueled by people. It's not something magical, it's just people. And uh, we're now coming down the other side of that hill as the folks in my age group, you know, are, are retiring, those are the baby boomers. And so by, by sometime in the mid 2020s, we will no longer be creating new participants for the workforce from our natural population. The only immigration will fuel our workforce growth. So um, right now, it's a, it's you know a big piece of, of, of immigration is doing the, doing that work now, and so that's that's the the base on which you you do your math about uh, about debt. So the economy needs to be growing to continue to service the debt, just as an individual's income needs to still be there to service their personal debt. So that calculus is complicated, and I you know I don't have a bottom line for you, but those are some of the elements that are at play. A lot of things that, uh, moving in that analysis, and uh, and you know we but, but remember what we've been through. People people forget just how bad the financial crisis was 
and that we had all of the ingredients of the second Great Depression. You can just imagine if the past 10 years had been like the 30s instead of what they've been like and what debt would look like, et cetera. So I think that's been managed quite well, actually, compared to what it could have been. But there can't be zero legacy. You know, there, there has to be a legacy there of all that. And that will take us some time to, uh, to pay off and take care of. That's absolutely right. It's a good question. It's not an easy answer. Okay, so at this point we need to uh, wrap up the Q&A. So how many questions was that? Did somebody add I them hope up? nobody was keeping track. Oh. <laughs> All right. Oh, there was one last question over here. That I, this woman was on her feet. Can, can we do okay, yeah, yeah. She, she was on her feet. All right. Uh, just, yep, do you mind? Absolutely. All right. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to ring me for every dollar possible. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Hi, I'm Pam from CIBC. Yeah. Um, we're obviously uh, wondering what you think interest rates are going to climb to and whether you see something like the 80s where they were in the 18, 20% range. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that question, Pam. You're welcome. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I started work at the Bank of Canada in 1981. That's when interest rates peaked. Uh, so they've been coming down since I... <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, look, I, I, as I said, um, the, the, what we consider to be neutral would be, a play, would be a natural place to think of where home would be for the interest rate. Um, and that, we think, is somewhere between 2.5 and 3.5 percent, call it 3 percent as a, as a working approximation. But there's a zone around it for a reason, because we're not sure uh, where, where the things would be uh, neutral. There are still forces acting on the economy that suggest we're, it's not time to be at neutral. Uh, and we don't control it. Uh, the neutral rate is largely a function of international interest rates, like the U.S. So, so you can see, like, you know, if U.S. interest rates are rising, even if the Bank of Canada rate is unchanged, the bond market will take some of that, and then our interest rates will rise, and so will mortgage rates and so on, without the Bank of Canada rate changing. So we, we live in a world like that. Uh, so all those forces are acting to bring the world back to normal, and it's happening faster in some areas than in others, and so there's a lot of uncertainty around it. But, uh, you know, if you thought that interest rates could someday be back to 3%, that would be a great day because it would mean that all these awful things that have been happening to us have, have dissipated and we've gotten back what we think is roughly normal. Um, and so most economists, you know, that, uh, you know, you ask them, they'll say, well, you know, rough or ready, someday we'll get back to around 3% for short rates. But that's a someday. We, we don't know how fast or, or at what pace it would happen or, you know, how long it might take. Okay. okay, so that, uh, that puts a wrap on this. I'd like everybody to uh, take a moment and join me in thanking uh, Governor Palaz and joining us here today and speaking Great. with us. Thank you. Thank you.